Hello and welcome back. For those of you that may not know, this is part two of a two-part special where I take a look at several unique, rare, and mysterious creatures that are said to roam within various woodland areas in the North American region. All of these creatures are contained within a book written by William T. Cox called Fearsome Creatures of the Lumberwoods with a few desert and mountain beasts. I highly recommend you watch part one first if you haven't seen it already, as the first part of this story contains some really weird creatures that you definitely don't want to miss out on. Today, we conclude the story and take a look at the rest of the creatures within the book. And while the ones from part one were very weird and interesting, these next 10 creatures are definitely a step up from them. So let's get into it. There's been a lot of debate and opinions on the Hodags' true appearance. Some say it was covered with horns and had an almost deranged disposition. Some have also said it resembled closely to that of a rhino and was even the size of one, which seems to be the most consistent description. Followed by this, people have also stated that it is a slow and hairless but intelligent creature that has a large spade-like bony figure at the end of its snout, completely blocking its vision from the front and making it so it can only see straight up. But this has its advantages. Because it can only see straight up, it's more observant of its natural food source, which are porcupines. If the hodag sees a porcupine hanging around in a tree, it immediately goes to that tree and uses its spade-like bone to dig around that tree in the hopes of bringing it down with the porcupine. And if it does, it then crushes the poor animal and devours its head first. Since reading this book, I always get surprised by how ridiculous some of these names are, but then I remember that they were probably named after drunk lumberjacks, so then it makes sense again. The Squonk is one of these creatures, and after reading about it, I now feel bad for making fun of its name, because according to the book, the Squonk is one of the most depressing and unhappy creatures out of everything here. And to give you an idea of this, hunters are able to track down this animal using just the Squonk's tear-stained trails, because according to folklore, it's always crying. I could already see comments popping up of how many people can relate to this specific creature because there's nothing more relatable than depression, am I right everybody? Anyways, the animal also has a very weird feature where in cases in which it is surprised or scared, it will dissolve itself into tears. This was figured out by J.P. Wentling who had successfully captured a squonk and put it into a sack so he could carry it home. Throughout the entire trip back home, the poor thing was crying in the bag until suddenly it just stopped. When Wentling opened the bag, he found it to only be filled with tears and bubbles. The Whirling Wimpus is a deadly creature that's most likely responsible for the disappearances of several hunters and hikers that traveled into the Cumberland Mountains of Tennessee. The Wimpus is physically structured similarly to that of a gorilla having long arms and a gorilla-shaped head and body. Along with that, it also had abnormally large hands. What gives it its name is its unique hunting method which is to wait at or near the bend of a trail where unsuspecting people or animals might walk. It then begins to whirl, causing a strange droning sound and when prey comes around the bend, the wimpus strikes and kills its victim. The agropelter is a mischievous creature of deadly proportions. There have been many cases of men working in the woods dying to dead branches falling from old trees, crushing their skulls, and even pinning them to the ground. Little do people know they are actually the victims of what some would probably consider an extremely sick joke. The agropelter is known to reside in these old dying trees, primarily in ones that are hollow, and drop or throw dead branches at unsuspecting people walking by. Why it does this isn't completely known and the dead branches are always blamed for the men's deaths. However, one managed to survive a fallen branch that was really dropped by the agropelter. Despite the fact that the branch caused a severe injury to his skull, he was conscious enough to see the creature before it disappeared into the woods. He described it as a slender creature with long arms and an ape-like face. Despite its slender physique, it's able to break off branches and throw them like nothing no matter how big or dense they are. The Splinter Cat gets its name from its unique style of hunting and or searching for its food. It primarily feeds on raccoons and honey from beehives, both of which would most likely be found within the trees of the Rocky Mountains. What the Splinter Cat will do is find a high point where it can get a good view of the surrounding trees and will jump at the one it chooses to destroy. And to destroy a tree, the Splinter Cat will simply smash through it using its hard face and pass through it like nothing. And it will keep doing this to the trees until it manages to find some food. 
The Snow Wasset, I think I'm pronouncing that right, is a very strange creature whose activities are often seasonal, as it's mainly known for being active during winter. During the warmer seasons, the Snow Wasset goes into hibernation, and during this period it is described as a green-coated creature with rudimentary legs. But when winter comes, it undergoes a rather unusual transformation. Its fur will turn from green to white, and it sheds off its limbs completely, as it is known to burrow and slither through the snow, almost like a snake. This is where its hunting technique comes into play, as the wasset will make its way through the snow, hunting for any and all sorts of prey. Its voracious appetite and massive size gives it a rather broad diet, being able to feast on things as small as rabbits, to being able to devour things as big as wolves. Once the winter comes to an end, the snow wasset will regrow its small legs and go back into hibernation, and will stay there until the next winter comes. The Central American Wind Toster may not be a large animal, but its appearance alone can leave you overwhelmed. The overall build of the creature is one that leaves me extremely confused. Apparently the Wind Tosser's head and tail are attached to his body with a swivel-like neck, being able to rotate them in a full 360 degree motion. Along with that, the Wind Tosser is also known to have three sets of legs, one on each side of its triangular structured body. That way if it gets knocked down or attacked, it can just land on its other set of legs and and rotate its head and tail to a comfortable position. Aside from that, the Wind Tosser is still considered to be a dangerous creature as it is extremely aggressive, and if that wasn't already enough, the creature is also said to be difficult to kill. The Bildad is a rare and shy creature that resides near a pond within the northwest region of Maine, specifically in a place called Hurricane Township. Its diet consists of fish, and hunts them by wading by the edge of the water, wait for one to swim near the surface, and then they jump over them and bring its heavy and flat tail down on it, leaving the fish stunned enough for the Bildad to retrieve it and take it back to shore. As far as how it is with the neighboring lumberjacks in the area, the Bildads tend to keep their distance, as mentioned before, they're generally shy creatures. But the lumber Jacks couldn't help themselves and needed to find out if the Bildad could serve as a delectable meal. But this would prove to be a failed experiment. One Bildad was hunted and taken to a cookhouse not far from the pond where it was served up in a stew. It was served to a local swamper who took a bite and suddenly he stiffened up and began to yell then ran outside towards the pond to which he leapt into in the same posture as the Bildad and sank down into the water. Why the meat of the Bildad drove him to do this nobody seemed to know but since then everyone's been afraid to even touch one. The Tripadero is a rather obscure creature that's known to reside in areas in California. This creature had a very unique physical build as it had a drooping tail, a long snout, and legs that were able to extend or reduce its length as they were built like telescopes. It would usually extend its legs to get a better view of its surroundings and or to look for prey. And it would reduce its legs if it wanted to creep through the bushes to observe things from a lower perspective. Once it caught sight of its prey, it would extend its legs and aim its snout directly at it, to which it then shoots out with a book called Sun-Dried Quids of Clay that it keeps stored within its mouth. Getting hit with this will surely knock its prey out and once it does, it will then go over and feast upon its prize. Definitely one of the weirder ones in this book. And finally, we have our last entry in the Fearsome Creatures Saga, the Hyapom Hogbear. And I just have to say, what a weak ending to this book. The Hogbear is not a cool or weird or even notable creature. According to the book, it's literally just a variety of black and or brown bear that gets its name from the fact that it eats hogs mainly around the northern regions of California. It doesn't actually have any features or abilities or anything that really makes it stand out. In fact, the only thing that stands this creature out is the fact that it's the most ordinary one in this book. The book describes this bear as being somewhat small, having curly hair, and feasting on hogs that fatten up on nutritious acorns. And I'm not joking, that's pretty much it on this creature. So yeah, not the best ending to this book. I was hoping for something a little more weird, but regardless, after looking through everything here, I can confirm that overall, this was definitely an interesting read. A lot of these creatures are ones I've never heard about, and it's interesting to learn more about what Northern American folklore was like back in the early 1900s. And I'm aware that they remade this book in 2015, and I may cover it someday on the channel. 
From what I've heard, some of the stories of these creatures have been updated, meaning there were probably more sightings made between then and 2015, which could possibly reveal more about these creatures, given they're even alive at all. These creatures' existence is still up in the air and has no doubt led to a lot of speculation and skepticism. Regardless, as I mentioned before, it's still fun to take a closer look and read something as bizarre as this book. But anyways, thank you all so much for watching. We're going to get back into the more dinosaur-related stuff in the next video, which will hopefully be out sometime within the next couple of weeks. No promises. I hope you all enjoyed this little Halloween special, even if it was a little late. It was definitely a fun little one-off to do, and I look forward to doing more of them in the future. Thank you all for watching, and have a nice day.